Hello and warm greetings. Welcome to The Analyst by Vajiram and Ravi. Today is 8th of April and we would try to comprehensively analyze few articles from the Hindu and the Indian Express. The first article is about the World Health Day and the importance of health equity. The second article is about the growing concern with respect to the youth suicides in India. The third article is with respect to the importance of MSMEs, the challenges faced by them and the way forward. The fourth article is about what is solar eclipse and what are the types of solar eclipse. The fifth article is about what semiconductors are, what is wafer, what is fabrication technology. And finally, we'll read about some of the very important articles with respect to the prelims preparation in the prelims snippet sections. So let's start with the first article. So the first article is about the World Health Day. So yesterday we celebrated the World Health Day to commemorate the establishment of the World Health Organization. Now this gives us the opportunity to discuss about an important issue that is the health equity. We also must remember that the WHO has declared health to be a fundamental human right. And this year's theme is my health, my right. Now this concerns with GS2, health and social sector. So let's start. Now, if we talk about the World Health Organization, this is a specialized agency of the United Nations and it is responsible for international public health, right? It is headquartered in Geneva, Switzerland, and the official mandate of the WHO is to promote health and safety while also focusing upon the vulnerable segment of the population, right? Now, the functions of the WHO are, it provides technical assistance to different countries, then it sets international health standards, then it collects data on the global health issues, serves as a forum for scientific and policy discussions, right? Now, the official publication of the WHO is the World Health Report, and it gives us important information with respect to the assessment of worldwide health topics right it gives us a detailed picture about the worldwide health topics now the who has consistently played a leading role right in several public health achievements for example it played a key role in the eradication of smallpox then it played a key role in the eradication in the near eradication of polio it also played a key role in the development of ebola vaccine Right. So these are the achievements. So if we talk about the administration of the World Health Organization, it is governed by the World Health Assembly. Now this actually elects and advises an executive board, which actually consists of 34 health. So this consists of 34 health specialists. Now, w, it, it also elects, it also selects actually the WHO's chief administration, also known as the director general, right? And it sets the goals and priorities for the coming years. Now. We need to also remember that it also actually approves the budget, right? The annual budget. And it actually tells us what the activities of the WHO would be in the forthcoming year. Now, it is primarily funded by the contributions made from the member state. Also, private donors form a key part of financing mechanism for the WHO, right? Then the theme of this year's World Health Day is my health, my right. Now we need to understand that there is an alarming gap in the healthcare access. And now this is highlighted by the COVID-19 epidemic. Then you have got different environmental crisis, right? And then you have got socio-economic conflicts around the world. So this actually gives us the opportunity to discuss the importance of health equity right now even though even though over 140 nations they have recognized health as a constitutional right still around 50 percent of the population needs or lacks access to essential medical or health services right so this is an important cause of concern now that is why we need to actually stress the concept of the health equity now let's talk about what health equity is about right so it actually ensures that every person has an equal opportunity to achieve their highest health potential irrespective of their circumstances now we need to recognize the fact that we have got social economic and environmental factors that actually impact the health of an individual and not just 
this idea goes beyond the genetics. It's not just the genetics, but we have got socio-economic and environmental factors which impact the health of the individual. Now, the WHO's mission is to eliminate unfair and preventable disparities in health outcomes. That is among different socio-economic categories. That is the objective of WHO, right? Now, health equity addresses the root cause, the root cause of health inequities. For example, you have got poverty, right? Then you have got discrimination on the basis of religion, caste, right? Then you have got limited access to quality education or housing or clean water, right? So the concept of health equity caters to all these aspects, tries to rectify all these loopholes, right? Now, thus attaining health equity necessitates a comprehensive strategy that is which goes beyond goes beyond the legislative reform and actually stresses upon the socio-economic determinants of health right now if we talk about the global challenges the first is covid 19 pandemic right so it actually revealed the case that infectious diseases they actually target they mostly target the vulnerable and the marginalized section of the society right then we have got climate change. So climate change poses a threat, a serious health risk. That is, it disproportionately impacts the low income groups, the marginalized sections, right? Then you have got the healthcare provision is severely hampered by the conflicts. What we see in Israel, Palestine, right? The conflicts have totally actually disturbed the health infrastructure, right? So what it actually means is that it is leading to lack of access to vital health supplies right so lack of access to vital health supplies because of all these conflicts right now if it in particular talk about the india's health equity challenges the first is that india faces a persistence op obstacle because of the health equity because of large and diversified population so that is the most important reason why india actually faces these persistent obstacles right now According to the 2011 census, 2011 census, the urban slums in India, they are actually, they actually constitute 17% of the India's metropolitan areas. Now we need to understand that it exhibit serious health risks. That is risks aggravated by overcrowding, right? Then you have got poor sanitation, right? Lack of access to clean drinking water, right? So these, these are all the factors which actually aggravate the health conditions in the slums, right? Now, infectious disease. So, according to the ICM ICMR, the risk of infectious disease, for example, tuberculosis, is 1.5 times more in these areas as compared to non-slums areas, right? Now, if you talk about the health disparities across the caste and gender, we would see that according to the National Family Health Survey 5 data, the SCs, the scheduled castes and scheduled tribes, they experience higher child mortality, right? And also lower immunization rates, right? Now, if we talk about the women, the women in the lowest wealth quintile, that is lowest 20%, right? Around 59% of the women in the lowest quintile, they actually suffer from severe anemia, right? Now, this number is almost double of what the women in the top quintile suffer from, right? So this is, you, you actually see the disparity in terms of income, right? Now, it actually demonstrate the intersection of caste, gender, and economic status in the health outcomes, right? Now, if we talk about the non-communicable diseases, they account for more than 60% of all the fatalities in India. And a data from the Public Health Foundation of India, it, it actually says that there's a necessity of equitable treatment access and preventive health care and it states that the economic effect of these non-communicable disease would be around six trillion dollars by 2030 right so what we need to focus upon is a comprehensive strategy now coming to the other aspect that is india suffers from critical shortages of doctors right that is health care professionals right so according to the wso data we have only 0 0.8 doctors per thousand people like this is obviously below the advice number moreover over 75 percent of the healthcare professional now they are actually situated in the metropolitan area and the population of the metropolitan area as a total population of the country is just 27 percent right so 75 percent of the healthcare professionals they are catering to 27 percent of the population thus it actually also tells us about the rural urban divide the rural urban disparity right now next is 
what are the other factors right which actually calls for health equity in india now we know that the there is no right to health as a fundamental right in the indian constitution but we have got the directive principles of state policy right in the part 4 of the constitution so it actually provides the basics the basis for the right to health now if we talk about article 39 sub clause e it it actually directs the state to secure the health of the workers right then article 42 it actually emphasizes on the just and humane conditions of work and also maternity relief right then we have got article 47 now this focuses upon the duty of the state to raise the nutrition level and the standard of living to raise the nutrition level and the standard of living of the people right so it actually these articles direct the state to focus upon the concept of public health right moreover article 243 g it actually endows the panchayat and municipalities to strengthen the public services right so the third tier of the government it also has the duty to actually improve the health outcomes right now a large segment of the population is the migrant population right so india has the total number of interstate migrant workers according to the census 2011 it is 41 million right now the total migration rate it is 28.9% according to the periodic labor force survey of 2020 right so what we mean to say is that there are a lot of migrants there's a lot of migrant population in india and we need to give them adequate health services so that they actually become more productive and contribute to the overall development of the country next thus two aspects of health actually demand focus attention the first is the primary health care and the second is reducing the out of pocket health expenditure right so these are the two areas where the indian policy should focus upon right so how we can actually achieve these who targets right what we need is sort of a multi pronged strategy right a multi dimensional strategy which actually caters to different determinants of health right socio economic determ- determinants of health the first is for example the strengthening the healthcare system so what we need is increase investment in healthcare infrastructure personnel and equipment so according to who what we see is that low and middle income countries they spent a lower amount of money as a part of the gdp as a percentage of gdp than the developed countries on the health right so this quantum of money by the low and middle income countries has to be increased right then we have got training and upskilling of healthcare professional that is doctors nurses community health workers right for example we have got asha workers accredited social health activists we have got the aganwadi workers so all these all these people from the health sector they need to be actually given proper skills proper training right so that they can actually provide robust health services right then we have got the u- concept of universal health coverage see this concept of universal health coverage it actually means access to affordable and quality health care for all irrespective of their income and background right so access to affordable and quality healthcare irrespective of the person's background or income that is universal health coverage so what we see is that this is a who target so we need to actually move in that direction then we have got prioritizing the preventive care so promoting disease prevention through campaigns vaccinations right early screening of disease right through that we can actually implement this prioritize the preventive care now the who report significant progress in child mortality right that is due to increased vaccination coverage so there is an there is an improvement in this because of large vaccination coverage right then we need to actually encourage healthy eating habits right regular physical activity and then we need to also focus upon the mental well being through community programs right education right so that we can actually prevent chronic diseases for example stroke right heart diseases diabetes right next we have got addressing the social determinants of health so we need to invest in those social programs that is which address the poverty right and the inequality in inequity so what we need to focus upon is those programs which strike 
at the root cause of poverty, right? So that we can ultimately have good health outcomes. Then access to safe water and sanitation. See, UNICEF also already stresses upon the fact of wash, that is water sanitation and hygiene facilities. So that is all in order to actually prevent the occurrence of waterborne diseases, right? So that is a cause of concern. Then that should be a way forward actually, right? So next we have got the technological innovation. What we need to focus upon is leveraging telemedicine. So we can actually expand the access to healthcare through this telemedicine. Then we need to focus upon data analytics so that we have got constant monitoring and we need to adopt, we can actually adopt those policy interventions based on this data analytics, which actually bring in results. Then we need to have global cooperation and partnerships. What we need to focus upon is collaboration between developed and the developing countries on the on sharing best practices. Then we have got knowledge transfers and then we have got technological transfers, right? So that should be the collaboration mechanism. Then we have got investing in the research and development of new diagnostics, treatments and vaccines so that we can also focus upon the entities, the neglected tropical disease, right? Or infectious disease like COVID-19. So that should be the way forward. So what we are saying is that achieving the WSO target, it actually requires holistic, which not just focus upon strengthening the healthcare infrastructure, but it also focus upon the socio-economic determinants of health. That should be the case, right? And we need to understand that this, this is an ongoing process and it requires constant monitoring, evaluation, and then adaptation of different strategies. The next article is about a very grave concern that is the youth suicides in India. So India has the distinction of actually having the highest number of suicides in the world. Now this is a very serious concern. Now this concerns with GS1 society and GS2 that is issues relating to the development and management of social sector. So let's start. So if you talk about what is suicide, so this is actually a tragic and untimely loss of human life. And this is all the more devastating because it is out of conscious volitional act that is out of the will of the person, right? Now, India has the highest number of suicides in the world. According to the data by National Crime Records Bureau, India had 1.71 lakh suicides in 2022. Now, this number is too grave, right? So suicide rate has also increased in India. And right now it is about 12.4 per 1 lakh population, right? But these figures are obviously underestimated. The reason being, being that there are inadequate registration systems, right? Lack of medical certification of death. Then you have got the stigma, which is attached to the suicides. So normally people don't disclose that the death is through the suicides, right? Now, this is a grave concern because 41% of all the suicides which happen in India, they are actually by the people who are under 30 years of age. Also, a young Indian dies every eight minutes due to suicide. Now, this is a huge and irreparable loss for the family, the society, the economy and the country as a whole. Right. Now, if we talk about what are the factors which are responsible for this suicide, right? So we'll see that suicide is a complex human behavior and you really cannot attribute a single, the death, the suicide to a single causative factor. That means the issues, the, the, the factors which are responsible for the suicide, they are multidimensional, right? So suicide in young people, it is multi-determined and it is a result of interaction between biological, psychological, familial and other socio-cultural factors, right? So it is a result of these factors. Now, the most common reported risk factors in India are the mental health problems that constitute around 54%. Then you have got traumatic family issues, that is 36%. Academic stress, that is 23%. Social and lifestyle factors, which constitutes 20%. Then you have got the violence, which constitutes 22%. Economic distress, that constitutes 9.1%. And then you have got relationship factors, which constitutes 9%, right? So physical and sexual abuse, examination failure, they're associated with youth suicides. Also, we have got issues like parental pressures, right? And we have got issues like caste discrimination, right? So these are also the issues. Then we have got specific socio-cultural factors for suicides among the young girls, among the young girls and women, right? For example, we have got the early arranged marriages, right? Young motherhood. Then we have got low social status. Then we have got domestic violence. Then we've got economic dependence on the partner, right? Rigid 
social norms so they actually compel a women to go for this suicide right now we need to understand that there is a sort of flaws in our education system too too right because failure in the examination it compels sometimes the students to take this drastic step of suicide right also according to the data around 2095 people they actually committed suicide because of examination failures right in 2022 so this number is huge right next we have got the enormous competition the pressure the pressure faced by the Uh, candidates the students because of the competitive examinations we have right so months of pent up pressure right this continuously study for uh, months right and when they don't get the desired result they have they actually they are compelled to take this drastic step because of the pressures the social pressures right moreover once you are in this process of preparation you are very emotionally prone right and any misguidance at this step or any pressure it actually leads to this step of suicide right then you have cases of alcohol and substance as use abuse the people who are actually now these are the risk factors one of the risk factors for the suicides among the youths right then we you have got the over consumption of internet now understand that it has been actually through the data it has been seen that almost 20% of the college going students they are net addicts right so this is a data from 19 states which says that almost 20% of the college students they are net addicts right moreover there are instances of cyber bullying which actually leads to this drastic steps it has also been come from the data that those students who spent more than 2 hours on social media they are more suicidal right then you have got sensational reporting of suicides by media now this actually leads to increased suicidal behavior right so uh, recently uh, following the suicide of a very popular actor we saw that there was an increase in the searches on the google of how to commit suicides now this is really a grave concern right now what are the solutions we need to focus upon the solutions for this crisis the first is we need to actually remove this notion this notion that suicides cannot be prevented as it is individuals decision or it is because of the socio economic factors that notion has to be countered right first of all then young people they actually need to be taught problem solving impulse control then you have got emotional regulation skills right along with there needs to be an improved health help seeking behavior right that is needed then we have got the early identification of mental distress and provision of care that is also needed right then adopting healthy lifestyle it improves mental health for example we have got meditation right or physical activity or moderate and moderate use of internet now this actually improves the mental health and it lowers the suicides among the youth right then there needs to be educational reforms see that assessment mechanism which only focuses upon the marks that that has to be done away with right what we need to focus upon is a sort of an assessment mechanism where we focus upon the improvements the gradual improvements attained by the candidates and not just the performance with respect to the other candidates right now societal changes also have to be there people commit suicides in cases for example caste discrimination right discrimination with respect to tribals right then sexuality people from the lgbt com- bt community they actually there are also instances where these people commit suicides because of the stigma attached in the society right so we need to reduce this stigma then there needs to be a sort of political will a strong political will combined with intersectoral co- collaboration and community awareness that is needed now we need to keep in mind that the ministry of health it actually came with a national suicide prevention strategy in november 2022 now this strategy it actually has recognized that collaboration between ministries of health education information and broadcasting social welfare as an essential component right and it also focuses upon the need to leverage educational institutions and the youth organization for example we have got the youth clubs or college ambassadors right so what we see is that the growing societies in the youth is really a serious concern and what we need is that this strategy needs to be disseminated to the state governments and adequate funding 
should be there devolved so that they can actually come out with those strategies which can actually focus upon the suicide prevention right and providing mental and emotional support to these people who are actually suffering from mental depression right so that they don't take that drastic step of suicides so let's come to the third article this is related to the msme that is micro small and medium enterprises so recently a group of msmes they have raised their concerns with respect to the reforms they want especially with regards to the gst that is a goods and services tax so what we'll talk about today is what msme is all about what are the challenges faced by them and what is the way forward so this concerns with gst indian economy and the related issues now coming to MSMEs in particular that is micro small and medium enterprises they are actually termed as the lifeblood of the indian economy right and they play a crucial role in employment generation in industrial development right in regional diversification right so the ministry of micro small and medium enterprises it actually classifies the micro small and medium enterprises on the basis of the investment and turnover so for micro enterprises the investment should not be more than 1 crore and the annual turnover turnover should not be more than 5 crores coming to the small the investment in plant and machinery should not be more than 10 crores and the annual turnover should not be more than 50 crores coming to the medium category the investment in the plant and machinery should not be more than 50 crores and the annual turnover should not be more than 250 crores right now according to the government of india there are almost 7 crore msmes across different sectors in the country and they actually employ around 12 crores people on it right so it actually plays a very important role for the overall economy right next we have got the msmes also contribute to the india's gdp so according to a data from cii confederation of indian industries they actually contribute around 30% to the indian gdp right next we have got that msmes are spread across the country right what it means is that it leads to balanced regional development right and it also reduces the migration from rural to urban areas right that is also the case so msmes also foster innovation by developing and adapting technologies to actually suit their suit their local needs and they also promote entrepreneurship and it actually leads to vibrant business ecosystem right so these are the actually the positive aspects of the msmes now we know that msmes contribute enormously to the country's overall gdp right and also the employment opportunities but they are suffering from various challenges and this is actually hindering their overall growth and potential so if we come to the challenges in particular we have got access to finance so obtaining timely and affordable credit is a major road roadblock for the msmes right so traditional lenders for example you have got the banks or financial institutions right they actually perceive these msmes as high risk borrowers because they have got less credit history they don't have that collateral right so according to the rbi only 16% only 16% of the msmes they actually get receive they actually receive timely credit from formal sources right now coming to the market access so limited access to domestic and international market it actually restricts the msme growth so according to the cii that is confederation of indian industries competition with larger players and complex regulation for exports now this actually hinders their foothold in the market right next is the technology adoption so keeping pace with technological advancement now this becomes challenge challenging for the msmes due to resource constraints we need to understand a fact that when compared to large enterprises they have got limited resources to actually leverage advance technologies so that what's make them backward when it comes to the technology domain next we have got also according to the msme development institute data almost 42% of these msmes they face hurdle while adopting these technologies right then you have the issue of regulatory burden so complying with a multitude of complex regulation now this process is time consuming and it is expensive for these msmes and it also diverts their focus from core business activities right and makes them to actually focus upon these non productive 
aspect right then also according to the world bank almost 27 percent of the msmes reported that they face hurdle while actually dealing with the regulatory processes right next is you have got the skill gap so the lack of skilled manpower it also hinders the msme productivity and innovation so according to the national skill development corporation the availability of skilled manpower and the skills demanded there's a huge gap between these two the availability of the manpower and the skills demanded so what we need to focus upon is proper skill upgradation right now if you talk about the way forward for this sector because we already know that it constitutes a, a very important part of the of the overall economy so for a healthy and prosperous msme ecosystem what we need is a sort of a multi-dimensional approach right so the first is the financial empowerment so according to a report by the international finance corporation there is a deficit of around 1 trillion dollar when it comes to the funding of msmes in the emerging economies right so we need to f uh, actually focus upon this deficit right so expanding expanding the government credit guarantee systems for example we have got the credit guarantee fund for the msmes which was launched by the government so we need to expand such mechanisms right so that the banks and other financial institutions they are incentivized to fund to these msmes right then we need to have got the encouragement of the alternate financing mechanisms for example we have got peer to peer lending right or we have got venture capital right so these options can also provide the additional funds which are required by the msmes then what we need to focus upon is fostering the market access so supporting the integration of msmes with e-commerce platforms this can provide them with access to wider market and it can reduce the geographical limitation also right so these are the two points then reserving a specific percentage in the government procurement now we already know that the msmes constitute an important part in the government e marketplace that is a public procurement platform for the government of india right so there needs to be a sort of reservation for these msmes in the public procurement processes then we need to skill the bridge the skill gap that is government and industry they need to collaborate to create a targeted skill development programs right so that it caters to specific industry needs then we have got promoting the apprenticeship programs right so that providing practical skills right and training so so as to bridge the gap between the skills required and the skills available right then you have got simplifying the regulatory procedure that is simplifying the regulations and the procedure this can reduce the compliance burden of the msmes and it can also free up their resources for core business activities right so that should be done then implementing a single window clearance system that should be so it can save time and money for these msmes again so that they can focus upon their core business activities then you need to encourage technology innovation and technology right so what is needed is you need to provide grants and tax incentives for the research and development right also government initiatives like the scheme for upgradation of technology it should be there so that there are financial incentives for the msmes to upgrade themselves technologically right then you have got the data driven approach what we mean is that there needs to be a sort of a repository a robust repository of data so that we can have monitoring mechanisms and on the basis of those monitoring mechanisms we can adopt specific policy actions that is the importance of data driven systems right then what is needed is the knowledge sharing that is between the industry between the msme between the governments for proper knowledge transfer and knowledge exchange right so what we see is that definitely there are issues but if we f uh, focus upon this multi-dimensional approach we can sort of have a more holistic development of msme sector and this will propel to the creation of jobs right and ultimately this would lead to the overall development of economy right so these are a mix of strategies required for the msme sector
So the next article is related to the solar eclipse. So today a solar eclipse will cross North America passing over Mexico, the United States and this type of solar eclipse is a very rare type of event. So we'll understand what solar eclipse is and what are the types of solar eclipse. Now this concerns with GS1 geography. So what is actually a solar eclipse, right? So solar eclipse, it occurs when the moon moves in the middle of the earth and the sun, right? So the moon actually blocks the light of the sun either fully or partially, right? And it casts a huge shadow. You can just see in this image that the moon is actually casting a huge shadow. Now, if you just look, focus on the image, you'll see that you have a very small section, which is very, which is darker in comparison to the, this section, right? So the darker portion is actually known as the umbra, right? And the lighter comparative to this section is known as the penumbra. So let's talk about it. So the umbra and the penumbra, the moon actually casts two main types of shadows on the earth. Coming to the umbra, it is the darkest part of the shadow and it occurs when moon completely blocks the sunlight, right? Now the umbra actually appears as a dark circle on the earth's surface and this is actually what is responsible for the total solar eclipse, right? Next, the size of the size of umbra, it actually depends upon the distance between the earth and the moon, right? So the farther the moon from the earth, the smaller would be the umbra, right? Now its location on the earth it also changes due to moon's orbital path around the earth, right? Now, if you talk about the penumbra, penumbra is the lighter, right? And it is the outer part of the umbra, right? That is a penumbra section, right? Now, in this region, it appears as a faintly darkened area surrounding the umbra and it happens during partial solar eclipse. Now we'll see what total solar eclipse is and what partial solar eclipse is, right? It is much larger than the umbra and it actually extends outwards from the dark circles. So it actually expands outward from the dark circle. You can see in this image. Now, coming to the types of solar eclipse, we have primarily four types of solar eclipses. The first is to total solar eclipse. The second is the annular solar eclipse. The third is a partial solar eclipse. And then you've got the hybrid solar eclipse. To talking about the total so solar eclipse, it occurs when the moon completely blocks the sun and it casts a dark shadow on the earth. Now, this is one of the rarest type of solar eclipse, right? Which is actually going to take place in parts of North America, right? So you can see in this image, a total solar eclipse in the first image. Then you have got the annular solar eclipse. Now this occurs when the moon is at or near the farthest point from the earth, right? So this actually leaves a ring of sunlight around the dark disk of moon. So it leaves a ring and that is the name comes from that is a annular, right? That is ring shaped. So you can just see in this image, the annular solar eclipse, right? Now coming to the partial solar eclipse. So this occurs when the moon only partially covers the sun and this can be seen from a wider area from the earth, right? Then a total or annular eclipse. What we see is a crescent shaped darkening in this image. Just see a crescent shaped darkening is actually appeared, right? Then you have got the hybrid solar eclipse. So in the hybrid solar eclipse, what happens is it is one of the most uh, it, uh, rare types of uh, solar eclipse and it actually begins as, begins begins as an annular eclipse and it ends as a total eclipse or vice versa vice versa so the reason is this happens because the moon's distance from the earth it actually changes throughout its orbit right so that is the reason you have got the transformation from one solar eclipse to the other that is from uh, annular to the partial or from partial to the annular right so these are the four types of solar eclipse you can just see in this image you have got this partial and then you have got the annular right so how often actually a solar eclipse takes place so it is witnessed during the new moon that is when the moon and the sun 
they are aligned on the same side of the earth right now new moon occurs about 29 days every 29 days 29.5 days but it does not mean that the solar eclipse happens every month the solar eclipse actually happens only two to five times annually now what is the reason see the reason is that the moon does not orbit the earth in the same orbit as the earth actually orbits the sun right the moon is actually tilted about five degrees with respect to the earth you can just see there is a, a five degree angle between these two orbits right the the plane of the orbits right so the two points on the orbit you have got this descending node and this ascending node so when the moon actually comes here at the descending node you have got a total solar eclipse so as a result most of the time what happens is that when the moon is actually between the sun and the earth the shadow of the moon is it is either too high or either too low right so that does not lead to a total solar eclipse it only leads to an annular or partial solar eclipse right now why is the total solar eclipse is so rare see normally solar eclipse it can happen around two to five times in year right but total solar eclipse it's a very rare phenomena right so this is because total eclipse is only visible if someone is standing at the umbra and that is a rare phenomena right so it only happens about once in 18 months or so and a particular spot on the earth it witnesses a total solar eclipse after a period of nearly 400 years right so the umbral shadow is very small it covers less than one percent of the globe moreover 70% of the globe is underwater right and 50% of the land is uninhabited so that is where if even if at some places so total solar eclipse is taking place the chances whether the people would see it is rare right so that is the reason that this phenomena of total solar eclipse is it's a very rare event right so the next topic is about the semiconductors now what we recently saw is that the tata group has partnered with taiwan's power chip semiconductor manufacturing corporation to set up a 300 mm wafer fabrication plant in gujarat now this forms a part of gs3 and science and technology we'll try to know what semiconductor is what a wafer is and what the process of fabrication is all about so if we talk about semiconductors now their properties are such that it lies between that of a conductor which freely conducts electricity for example you've got copper and that of an insulator for example you have glass which does not conduct electricity now this is the unique property there's a unique property in semiconductors which actually makes them almost omnipresent in all the electronic components we use starting from the smartphones to cars to critical defense supplies semiconductors are almost omnipresent right so in its purest form in its purest form the semiconductor is a very weak conductor of electricity however its electrical properties can be significantly enhanced through a process of doping so what happens is that in a pure semiconductor we add certain specific elements right we inject certain elements and that elements those elements are known as dopants right so once this process is known as doping right through this process you can significantly change the conductivity of that semiconductor now by injecting dopants into these semiconductors we have got the formation of complex integrated circuits and these can be printed onto the semiconductors and can be used in different electronic industries now this process creates two types of semiconductors this doping process so the first is n type of semiconductors so what we do is in a pure semiconductor we actually dope it with elements that have got one more valence electrons so for example you have got phosphorus doped silicon so this leads to the creation of more number of mobile electrons and thus enhanced conductivity then you have got the p type of semiconductors now what happens is in p type of semiconductors we dope it with elements that have got one less valence electrons right so it leads to the formation of holes that that is allowing positive charge to flow right thus it leads to a different type of conductivity for example you have got boron doped silicon right now what are the applications different applications of these semiconductors now by combining the n type and p type of semiconductors we have got different applications right for example the diodes now in what happens is diode says that it allows current flow in one direction only it doesn't allow the flow in the opposite direction then you have got transistors so these transistors they actually act as electronic switches or as amplifiers 
that is to amplify to increase the strength of weak signals right that is transistors then you have got integrated circuits so what happens is that we combine millions of transistors and other electronic component to create a sort of single chip and this actually this chip is the foundation of modern industry modern electronic industry from phones from to computers to critical defense supplies all these have these semiconductors chips right now what are the examples of semiconductors see the first is silicon now this is the most abundant of all and it is most widely used semiconductors right then you have got germanium so germanium it is used in some high speed transistors right then you have got gallium arsenide now this gallium arsenide is used in light emitting diodes also in micro microwave it has applications in microwave right so what is actually a wafer so a silicon wafer it is actually the foundation of modern integrated circuits right it is essentially a thin slice of highly pure crystalline silicon which serves as the starting point for the complex process of fabrication we'll study about it what fabrication is all about but it serves as a starting point of the process of fabrication right and through this process we actually finally convert it to complex integrated circuit chips right now let's talk about the fabrication technology right so fabrication technology also known as semiconductor manufacturing technology now this is a complex process where the raw semi uh, silicon it is actually converted into functional integrated circuits right so this whole process is known as fabrication now there are a lot of steps involved in the process so we need to be aware about what these steps are so the first step is the wafer preparation right so what is what happens is that ultra pure silicon is sliced into thin wafers and then it is polished to have sort of a mirror like finish right next we have got the step of photolithography now this is a critical step that actually transfers the circuit patterns onto the wafer surface what it involves is that it uses a photosensitive material for a pattern layer on the wafer right then you have got the third step of etching so etching it the the process it actually removes the unwanted material from the wafer and for example we use different techniques for example we have got chemical etching so through these techniques the unwanted material is removed from the wafer then we have got the technique of doping we already discussed what doping is to actually create either p type or n type of semiconductors right then you have the step of deposition now in this step we have got the films of various materials like metal silicon dioxide or uh insulators that deposited actually through steps like chemical vapor deposition right so these layers actually form the link between the transistors and other components right through this deposition right it creates a link right now coming to the next step of metallization as the name says it is related to metal that is thin layer of metal is deposited to create electrical con connections that is wires so that there is a sort of connection between transistors and other elements on the chips right a connection is established then you have got the step of passivization what it means as the name says passivization now this is a protective layer which is applied so that we can actually avert the damages and also prevent contamination that is the case that is a use for this passivization next we have the step step of testing and packaging so the completed wafer is actually diced into individual chips and each containing now these each chip contains a complete circuit right so these chips are then rigorously tested for functionality and then packaged to protect from physical damage 
so for functionality they are tested and then they are packaged so that there is no damage to it right so what we see is that semiconductor semiconductor manufacturing process it's highly complex it's highly technical it's very technical right that's the reason that this government of india has been giving different incentives for example we had the national semiconductor mission right we, the government also provide financial incentives to the tune of 76000 crores right then you have got the design linked incentive schemes right so what we see is that the government has definitely uh, given a sort of a impetus to the semiconductor manufacturing and that is the reason we see that different corporations in india for example the tata group they are coming in collaboration they are collaborating with other uh, technological giants and they are actually starting the domestic facilities so uh, it remains to be seen uh, how, how the progress of india would be in this domain and we hope that india emerges as one of the power houses of the semiconductor manufacturing in the coming decades next we have the prelims snippet sections uh, over there we'll try to discuss few of the articles which are very important from the perspective of the preliminary exam so the first is FAO that is Food and Agriculture Organization. So FAO is a specialized agency of the United Nations that actually leads the international efforts to defeat hunger. So that is the main objective. Then the World Food Food Day is celebrated to mark the anniversary of of the founding of Food and Agriculture Organization in 1945. Now with 194 member countries and European Union including India, FAO works in over 130 countries worldwide. Right. It is one of the United Nations food aid organizations which is based in Rome. Right. Its sister bodies are the World Food Program and the International Fund for Agriculture Development. Some of the very important reports published by the FAO are the state of world's fisheries and aquaculture, then the state of world's forest the state of food security and nutrition in the world the state of food and agriculture then the state of agriculture commodity markets right then you have got the next article which talks about the international court of justice so the international court of justice also known as the world court now it is the only international court that adjudicates the general disputes between the nations and gives advisory opinions right it is one of the six organs of the united nations and it is located at the hague Netherlands right the ICJ is a successor of the permanent court of international justice which was established in 1920 by the league of nations all the member states of the united nations are a party to the ICJ statute and may initiate contentious legal cases however the advisory proceedings may be submitted only by certain united nations organs right or agencies the ICJ consists of a panel of 15 judges elected by the united nations general assembly and the united nations security council for a 9 year term and judges are collectively they must actually reflect the principal civilizations and the legal systems of the world seated in the peace palace at the hague the icj is the only principal organ of the united nation that is not located in the new york city then you have got the organization that is aukus now the aukus is a trilateral security partnership for the indo pacific region between the australia the united kingdom and the united states now it was announced on 15th september 2021 the partnership involves the united states the uk assisting the australia in acquiring the nuclear powered submarines right the partnership also includes cooperation on advanced cyber mechanism artificial intelligence autonomy quantum technologies undersea capabilities hypersonic and countersonic electronic warfare innovation and information sharing now this partnership will focus upon the military capability and it distinguishes from the five eyes which also includes these three and new zealand and canada now the five eyes is primarily an intelligence sharing alliance right coming to the next article we have got the dgca that is directorate general of civil aviation so dgca is a statutory body of the government of india to actually regulate the civil aviation in india it became a statutory body under the aircraft amendment act 2020 now the dgca investigates aviation accidents and the incidents maintains all the regulations related to the aviation and is responsible for the issuance of licenses pertaining to aviation for example you got the personal pilot licenses student pilot li licenses commercial pilot licenses in india it is headquartered in the new delhi the government of india is planning to replace the organization with a civil aviation authority which is actually modeled on the lines of american federal aviation administration 
Now, its endeavor is to promote safe and efficient air transportation through regulation and proactive safety oversight mechanism. So that's all for today. Thank you.